came across this verse in verse 19. Following along, we read it too. It says, Jesus gave them this answer, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So you always ask the question, how did Jesus determine what to do next? Well, He said He had an ability somehow to see what the Father was doing in heaven, and He would replicate that. And so, um, and I read on down here, it says, by myself, verse 30, He says, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only what I hear. So, as uh, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Well, this morning, after I finished putting the touches and working on my sermon on baptism, that was what I was going to work on today. I got it all prepared, ready to go. And I had my devotions this morning, get up early enough to do that. And then I, uh, then I went to Facebook to greet the people at birthdays. And so doing, I came across Sherry Rouse's little comment about Sunday where she. Now, some of you might recall last week, somewhat from the first part of my sermon, I stopped and I said, there is a lady that made a great impact in my life. She's my youth leader back in the 70s. That was when I was just like a little girl. So, a uh, long time ago. And um, we prayed for her. She passed away at 6 o'clock the next day. I went to be with Jesus at 6 o'clock in the morning on Monday morning. And so, um, I just happened to come to Sherry's down here. It's not Ralph anymore. What's your last name? Martin. Martin. <laughs> so, Sherry Martin posted on Facebook the tribute that had been made by her husband and her daughter. And so, I got to reading those. And after reading this today, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you need to give a tribute to Sunday. And I wanted to introduce you to this person who is and has been my friend. Who probably, I would say, after my father, has made the greatest impact in my life. So I'm doing an audible. So you can take notes and scribble on the back of your bulletin, but you can waste, you're wasting your time if you're going to try to follow it, because I'm not going there. That's next week. Well unless the Spirit leads otherwise. I'm not promising predictability in this congregation. I hope you're going to get used to that. Uh, you know, you're never going to know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, uh, but uh, I will do my best, and this is my promise to you, I will always try to follow the Holy Spirit. And I believe this is His lead today. And if you'll bear with me on that. So, there's a, a picture of Sunday, and I want you to get to know her just a little bit. Uh, from those who probably knew her the best. And uh, I was quite moved as I read uh, at least part of the, uh, the thoughts that were shared, so I share that with you today. I hope it will touch your lives as it has touched many of ours. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father, I thank you so much for the blessing of relationships, all made possible through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you for the people that you have used to show me who you are, to help me understand your love. So Lord, as we take a few moments to give honor to Jesus by giving honor to one of your followers, I would pray that you would speak to all of our hearts, that we'd be challenged and by your grace changed even today. So I thank you, Lord, for every person in this room, and we ask now that you would just open our hearts and our minds to hear what you want to say to us today. All this we ask in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, um, you can leave that up there if you, the slide's up. Um, <clears throat> you recall that God has given us a mission to make disciples of all the nations. And that's what I feel like God's called me to do. And we're going to continue to study, well, what does that look like? What does a disciple look like? We're not interested in just making converts. We're interested in making disciples. That's different from just being a church attender. It's someone who is, in essence, married to Jesus Christ. So, Sunday, who you can see up there, I want to talk with you about how she was someone whom God used in my life as a disciple maker. I have been impacted in my life by three specific people. The first is my father, 
my sister's down here, two nephews, welcome today. Um, I'm the eldest of five. My father is a pastor, George Wood, who was, uh, had a church called Central Christian Church here in town, pastor during the 70s. He's definitely was my first disciple maker. He's the first one that poured his life into mine in a spiritual way, not just as a, a, a biological father, but as a spiritual father. He became both. And then uh, God, through my father, actually uh, invited Sunday to come and to be part of Central Christian Church. We learned just six months ago that Sunday had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. In fact, I was on my walkabout six months ago. Actually drove right past where she was being operated on at the time, in Boise, Idaho. I think she was in Nampa for the surgery. And so as I came past there, uh, that was uh, just something, just to know that she was in surgery at that moment. <clears throat> the greatest way to honor a person is to imitate them. You can go to the next one. There you go. Sunday imitated and honored Jesus well. In fact, quite honestly, when I first met her and hung around her a little bit, she was a little extreme. You ever run into those kind of people? Just a little over the top. A little, a little too excited. A little too happy. All the time, you know. A little too just alive. You know, just more than you should be. You know what I mean? Let's just calm down a little bit here. That was Sunday. And I love this statement. It says, it is no matter what the world thinks of us, but it is everything what they know and think of Jesus the crucified living, and she lived that. Sunday came to Wichita, Kansas from Boise, Idaho in 1970. I'd met her earlier. She'd been part of a singing group that brought this small group through uh, for a crusade at Central Christian Church. I was a senior at North High at the time, and when I first met Sunday, that's what she looked like. She was uh, a pretty lady, young lady. She's six years my senior, so, you know, Probably immediately I had an instant crush on her. Probably something like that. And uh, I remember Dad uh, told the story of wanting her to come to Central Christian Church. But at the time, there was only 300 people there in the church. And they really didn't have a lot of money. In fact, he went to the board not once, asked, would you be willing to invite Sunday to come and work with the youth? They said, no, we don't have the money. We can't afford it. He went back a second time, asked again. Would you be open to let Sunday come and be, and I says, sorry, we just don't have the money. The answer is no. Guess what my dad did? Third time, went back to the board and said, would you please let this lady, and finally the chairman of the board, actually, as I understand it, said to him, says, you're very serious about this idea of this young lady coming to be the youth leader of Central Christian Church. And he says, I absolutely am. My dad had an ability, and still does, to hear the voice of the Lord. So they risked it, if I can put it that way. They invited her to come. And so she came. This is kind of what she looked like. Remember, the first car she bought was a little yellow bug, convertible. And that was the one I remember riding around with her. She came from Northwest Christian College to our church. Sunday was a worshiper. She wasn't afraid to lift her hands. Didn't care. That, we weren't used to that in our Christian church. Didn't see a lot of that going on. She was full of the Spirit of God and the power of God, probably in a way that I've not really seen in an individual. And she was not afraid to express it. She was very open with her faith just in her life. And, she, and my dad said to us, well, Sunday, what do you want to do with the youth? He says, I want to build a choir. I want to build a youth choir. She began with just 10 students. I'd be one of those. I, in fact, came with, I was the first guitarist I played that. That little instrument over there. As I think I told you last week or so, the only time I played a guitar was in my bedroom. Me and Jesus played the guitar. He listened. And I wasn't good. I mean, I'm not sure I'm that good now, but I was not good. I remember her saying, would you come and play the guitar for us? And I was petrified, to be honest with you. There was 10 of us. And um, this group uh, grew and uh, rapidly, 1970 to 73, and to a large group of over 300 young people. 
We performed to the glory of God in Century 2 concert hall. That's one of the pictures. It's amazing, isn't it? Just that you get a group of kids start singing, and here it is. You have this humongous group of people. She organized these, uh, us on a Sunday or a Wednesday night into small groups. The older ones would teach the younger ones, so we had discipleship going on. She was a master discipleship. But Sunday had talked to every one of those young people. Whenever they wanted to become part of the choir, she had them come to her office, she would talk with them about where they were with the Lord. Did they know Jesus? And she would lead every one of them. She had talked to every single one of them and led almost all of them to Christ. They were all baptized into the Lord. It's an amazing, amazing woman. And, and she got us to sound good. I mean, we actually sounded good. Now, the 300 kids. And uh, we, we embraced, we imitated her. Can I say it that way? Because she looked a whole lot like Jesus, so we imitated her, and that's how we knew what Jesus was like. Um, <clears throat> from this large group of 300 young people, there was, um, there was a smaller group, and uh, called the small group. <laughs> These were the older, younger, young people. And you'll notice this guy on the far left with a guitar in his hands looks strangely like my younger brother. Well, that's me. So uh, the one next to, just to, you know, I'm looking at backwards here, but over here next to Sunday is my father. And that was a smaller group that traveled around the country in the summertime. In 1974, this same group was sent to Australia. We, we gathered up, saved enough money, and this group traveled all the way to Australia and back. So it was an amazing experience, to say the least. And, there was, and it was life-transforming. I shall always remember the, the day that Sunday said to me in those early days, he said, would you, and I think it was one of the first few concerts, and it wasn't very big, probably in the church somewhere, and she said, would you introduce a song? I says, what? He says, get up there and introduce the next song. Well, I just, you know, I am not like I am today, believe me. I was absolutely panic-stricken. And I probably went up and said something profound like, and next song is, he's everything to me. You know, that was the first song we ever learned. So that was, it's hard for you to believe that it's hard for me to get up and speak. But that was the case in those days. So 1974, we went there and back. Eventually, Sunday left uh, Wichita and moved back to the Boise area, where she met and married Harold Weshey, and um, more commonly known as Bud. Now, I've only met Bud one time, just briefly, and... Obviously, was a gentle man and a wonderful uh, man of God. Sunday and Bud had two children, Annie and Johnny. Sunday loved her children. And I've never actually sh met Annie. I've never met Johnny. I have corresponded a lot with Annie. And all I can tell you is this young woman, I would put her right up here and let her speak. She will rock your boat. Because the, the, I've never seen such a passion just in her writing. And we have dialogued quite a bit. She's definitely set apart to the Lord. She's still unmarried at this point, right? She's a great catch, gentlemen, if there's anybody out here that ever won a godly woman. But boy, you better be up there if you're going to catch her because she is really full of the Spirit of God. She is her mother's daughter in an amazing way. And um, not even having, even verbally talked with her. I have just had many, many uh, correspondence through email with her. Um, Sunday was a faithful and loving wife, and I want to share just a few thoughts from his tribute, Bud's tribute, that he gave her just two days ago, February 9th. And this is what uh, Bud, and I'm reading from his notes, says, uh, Sunday left a few notes with instructions for her funeral. She wrote, Bud Weshi, to give message, one that people can understand, smile, smile, and not more than 20 minutes. So, uh, so I'll do my best to fulfill her expectations. Words are inadequate to describe this unique woman of God that he so kindly gave me the privilege of knowing, loving, and being a husband to, sharing life with, raising two children with, being my best friend and being blessed by her love and the companionship for these 40 years. Except for my eternal salvation, she has been God's greatest gift to me. When God brought us together, he gave us each the same verse to share as our verse, Psalm 34, verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let me ask you a question, couples. Has God given you a verse together? 
It's an interesting thought to have. When we got married, Kathy and I, gave, God gave us a passage together. And uh, Philippians chapter 2. And that's, uh, that's interesting. And maybe if you've got, never got one, you would ask, Lord, is there a verse that would frame up our marriage? When God brought us together, oh, I've said that, we have, we have the reference engraved in our wedding rings. In her lifetime, she has fulfilled that verse with me in many ways. I never dreamed possible. She was outspoken in her love for the Lord Jesus and her witnessing for him. And her prayer life was so real and passionate with regular faithful prayer for the many people that God placed upon her heart. She was truly a woman known for prayer. And you're going to hear a lot of this. She taught us how to pray. She gathered people to pray. And she would pray for someone right on the spot time and time again. She was also a woman of the Word of God. Her Bible was thoroughly marked with verses that the Lord used in her life to teach her, to comfort her, to refresh her hope. Her Bible is also marked with the people's names that she'd been praying for, usually beside a verse that was meaningful in the life of that person. She had a stack of cards with people who had written down their prayer requests for her, which she prayed over daily. Her prayers were informed prayers from the Word of God, and she was ready and reading and studying the Scriptures, was always bathed in prayer, crying out to God for understanding and for the ability to do what he was instructing her to do. The Bible instructs us to pray for our enemies. And when she was mistreated, her response was to pray for those people, and she harbored no bitterness. Sonny was the kind of person I shall always remember had the ability to go up to people that intimidated me all over the place, particularly businessmen, people that nobody would approach because they're sort of intimidating, kind of like your dad sometimes. People that, you know, like, whoa, they're heavy. But she had an amazing way of touching them with the love of Jesus and would talk to them, and they would be fascinated with this lady Sunday because of the, just simply the love, the, the, the light that was flowing out of her. Bud goes on and says one of her many favorite verses was Romans 12, verse 12, and it said, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. She asked Annie, her daughter, to make three parts of this verse into frame prints to hang on our wall, one for each of these commands. Sunday was a living example of obedience to all three for the glory of God. More than anyone I've ever met, she loved people, not in a superficial way, but with a genuine, sincere agape love. And that's true. One of the things that always caught you about is you felt like she really loved and cared about you. Now, I will confess, I worked with her for a summer. I didn't enjoy that. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. Can you believe that? I mean, I thought, oh, this is going to be an amazing person. You know, the, the amazing thing about Sunday, she was very real. And uh, she was hard to work for, though, I'll tell you what. But boy, I tell you, she was gifted, anointed. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, I, I always knew that she loved me. And that was so important. Sunday touched more lives with God's love than anyone I've ever known. And while I taught her things about God's Word and theology. She taught me more about relationships and caring for people. God brought together two people of very opposite personalities to complement each other. I have to confess, the first time I ever heard about Bud and saw him, I said, you've got to be kidding. Because, I mean, you, you expect this lady to marry someone who's going to be, you know, dynamic, you know, some great... But this guy is very quiet, very calm, very... just what she needed, you know, uh, I'm sure was the case. So if you're wondering, why did God give me this person to marry? Now you know, now you know. God wanted to balance us out. I don't know what God did to me. I got a wild one in my, in my situation here. So, our creator and the mighty planner of lives is so very wise. He knew how much we needed each other. I've been blessed beyond measure to be the husband and her life companion. And then I moved to Annie's tribute. And with this, I bring a conclusion here. And he writes this, Lord, let me live that I may bring you glory. That was Sunday's verse. Let me live that I may bring you glory. These are the beautiful words I witnessed and poured out from my mum's heart. And by the way, she uses the word M-U-M. -M. That's the Australian spelling. Mum. And lips just movements, moments before she was wheeled in for brain surgery. That was her words just before she's going in for brain surgery. It's interesting. A person is who 
is truly revealed in the moment of great suffering or fear. Who they really are is revealed at that moment. Let Lord, let me live that I may bring you glory. Her body was battling, but her life was safe in the hands of a loving, trustworthy, and mighty God. Her hope was confident in his power to heal and secure his perfect plan. But she cried out to live and live for his glory. For six months following that surgery, she has. With every nurse entering her hospital room, every visitor to the rehab facility, every therapist coming into our home, every friend stopping by, every phone call to pray with others, every text, every nightly prayer, me and every precious moment with her family, she brought him radiant glory through her faith, hope, joy, and perseverance, faithful prayers, bold witness, and love for the Word of God. Intentional love for people, and above all, she brought him glory through her ever steadfast and ever growing love for her blessed Redeemer, Savior, and friend, Jesus. She was all about Jesus. She probably taught me most to use his name. You don't have to talk to God, talk to Jesus. As I remember the life of my beautiful mom and as I live out the days to come, seeing, rem seeing reminders of her all around me, aching for her nearness, longing for embraces, missing her texts with angel emojis, wishing I could hear her pray again and share her wisdom with me about life and missing her in the sweet and significant moments yet to come. What I've learned from her will be treasures that remain deposited in my heart and forever impacting my life and walk with Jesus. I have no doubt that many of you have known or been witnessed as to many of these treasures, so I'd like to remember some of them together. And as I read these, I'm going to give you some things that she wrote. I certainly say amen to all of these things. The first one, she says, Jeremiah 33, 3. Does anyone besides the people that know Sunday, you know what that is? Has anyone ever heard Jeremiah 33, 3? It is called God's phone number. Have you ever heard that before? You say, well, what's God's phone number? Jer Jeremiah 33, 3. When I first came to Wichita, I used to have phone numbers. It was Murray something something or Amherst. You all remember some of, the, some of you gray hairs are nodding. You know, you know, that's right. Us older folks. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Mum would say, if ever you become the first turn for someone, give them God's phone number and have them go to him first. And if ever you find yourself seeking comfort and help from others, rather than going first to God, get on your knees and dial his phone number. Second lesson. In God's word, nothing is lost. From time to time, I was very young, I remember this being her confident reply when I would lose something. Anyone in that category, you ever lose things? I read the story, by the way, Bud mentioned the fact that she had moments where she learned how to give thanks and all things. She was on a boat, I guess, out in the ocean and dropped her wedding ring in the water. How would you have responded to that? She says, well, thank God. And then Bud probably said, oh my. <laughs> Go buy another one. Uh, in God's world, nothing is lost. He sees right now where it is. Let's pray. And he can show us just where to look. I must have learned that lesson. My wife drives me crazy. Have you ever felt frustrated looking for something? And the worst thing you ever have anybody say, well, have you prayed about it? Are you kidding? I'm so mad by this time. I, it's the last thing I can think about doing. I was playing in the, across from our house. We, we live across from the park, and the, the grass had not been mowed. I'd been over there playing, I don't know, with the dog or the, one of my, who knows what I was doing over there. But anyway, somehow I dropped my keys in the park. And uh, I went over, and you know, I looked around everywhere. I'm sure I saw everywhere. And I come back, and I was just so frustrated. Kathy said, what, did you pray about it? Of course, you know, when they ask you that, you know you haven't. Have you ever said, you know you haven't prayed at all, you know. You, I said, no. Okay, so I don't know whether she prayed for me. I says, you pray. I've done that a few times. <laughs> you pray because I'm in no state to pray. I am so frustrated. And, you know, believe it or not, the rest of the story is I, went, I, I prayed and went back over there. You know, I walked right to where they were. Just, you know. And I bet some of you had the same experience. Lord, you know where this is. I don't know where it is. Bring it to my mind. And he says, um, how many times she would remind me of this, and each time after we prayed, God would lead us to that which had been lost. He says, uh, next lesson, you can never outgive God. One of my favorite quotes from my dad in regards to mom was that he lovingly said, even if we had money, 
we'd have no money. <laughs> because mom simply delighted in giving all she had to bless and enrich the lives of others. If she had it, she gave it. If there was a need, she'd find a way to give something. She would tell me, Annie, you can never outgive the Lord. Every time you have an opportunity to give something, do it. Because anything you give away to bless others, God will always give you more in return. We were witnesses to this beautiful practice, me, time and time again. And it was just as true for the giving of her time and love as it was for so many things. Give and it shall be given to you. Another thing, pray about everything. Just pray. Nothing is too big or too small to bring to God in prayer. A parking spot at Costco. My name drawn in a raffle for the puppy I desperately wanted. Good weather for a friend's outdoor wedding. Needing a modest dress for an upcoming event. Finding a bargain. A life-altering decision. A struggling marriage. A broken relationship restored. A house to live in when we had nowhere to go. By the way, Sunday and Bud lost their house. <coughs> Couldn't pay for it. They had to move and God provided a place free of charge for, f for five months. Which was humbling on a Sunday. But they prayed. I will continually remember her saying, let's pray. And before he could answer, she always started praying. And that was true. I told you the story in a little car. The first time I met Sunday and drove on a personal thing, she asked me about something, and I, I responded to it, and she said, uh, well, let's pray about it. <laughs> Here? In the car? I didn't, I didn't, that's what I was thinking. She just didn't hesitate. She starts praying. I shall always remember being part of that small group, and we were somewhere in Illinois, Indiana. I don't know where we were. But we went up there, and we get ready for a concert, and we were all somewhat panicked because there was no piano to play. And we have a piano player and the whole thing. And, and so Sunday's constant response, why don't we just gather around and pray? Now, I would have said, who are we going to call? Let's get on the phone. We need to find a piano. That would have been illogical. Sunday's thing is always, let's stop and let's pray. And we prayed, and we prayed. I remember two or three people praying. And then I remember looking up, and we saw coming around the corner a truck with a piano in the bed. I was like, oh, man, alive. And that happened countless times. This woman believed that when she prayed, God would answer. And I always loved the girls. That was great. Sunday when she prayed, she prayed with intensity. She would clench her fists oftentimes. Lord, is that right, Meredith? I mean, did she do this? Somehow she would pray. And after a while, I started looking at all these girls, you know, Debbie Fanning and Debbie's and different ones. They'd be praying exactly the same way. They bent over and, Lord, we just ask this. They were imitators. Pray with people. When someone asks you to pray for them, don't just say you will pray. Stop right then and pray for them. Countless times I was witness to mum taking the hand of someone and praying for them on the spot. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to see that happen here. Don't be afraid. Well, let's pray about that right now. Let's stop and pray. Prayers don't have to be fantastic, do they? And God answers them. I'm looking at Carrie over here. <laughs> Carrie's like, you're not looking at me, are you? Because <laughs> I remember you coming up and saying, boy, my prayers aren't very good. But you know the best prayers are the just... Sincere prayers, simple prayers. In a grocery store, car parking lot, while at work, in the lobby of an event center, or in our home, lives were impacted by her faithfulness, confidence in God, and her sincere expression of love to take the time right at that moment to pray with Him. Next lesson pray when you say you will pray. Over the past six months, nearly every night, we gathered as a family to pray. And while we were praying for her sleep, her weak left side, her headaches, her healing from cancer, and any other need that was upon her, Mum was praying for those who had asked her for prayer. Night after night, no matter how weak she was, she'd faithfully bring before the Father the names and the needs of those she loved, family members, others who were sick, those who were praying for family, those facing new life challenges and those who did not yet know Jesus. Um, John felt the initiative to say, I feel we need to pray in this church. And last Tuesday came with a few others right down here to pray. And so several showed up. 
And I was talking to Harvey today and says that may have to increase. It's once a month right now. But may the day come when prayer is just operational in our whole ministry. There's going to be much prayer going on. Mum had a burning passion for prayer. It came from her total confidence that God hears when we call him. And that faith was coupled with a genuine God-given love for people. She wanted everyone to know how real God is. You can know that if mum ever told you she would pray for you, it was not once, but fervent and faithful prayers day after day until the need was met, the answer was given. I'm sure we, we will continue to find tucked away in her Bible, desk drawer and the drawers of her coffee table, countless well-handled note cards with names, prayer requests, and the answers written in when they came. Memorize the Word. Mum loved the Word of God and delighted in memorizing it. She would ask you, what verse are you memorizing? If you told her you couldn't memorize, she'd quickly say, of course you can. What's your phone number? What's your address? She was always ready to share his word, and rarely did you have to, an encounter with her where she didn't quote it. She knew the word of God, and she knew that it was powerful. She knew it's the power in her own life and was a champion for others to hide his word in their heart that through the encouragement of the scriptures we may, might have hope. Relationships are what matter. She embodied genuine love for people and always was reminding me that relationships are what matter. Because she was so filled with the love of Jesus, she could speak boldly and courageously. That was a secret, to be filled up first with Jesus. She remembered people, remembered special occasions in their lives or needs they had. She would comfort sin but even in the sting, uh, even in the, uh, I translate this, and this is something of the, the confrontation. She knew that she was loved. Oh, okay. Even in the sting of that confrontation, she knew that she was loved. She was intentional and pursued people. She championed righteousness and kept people accountable to faithfulness. I want to just stop right there. One thing that Sunday was very good at is keeping you accountable. You couldn't, there was, there was standards in the group. If you missed two practices, she would talk to you, why did you miss? And if your reasons weren't appropriate, she says, why don't you take a break? Now, I was never dismissed because I'd never missed. But it wasn't just come if, you're, if it works into your schedule. If you're going to be faithful, if you're going to be in this group, you need to be here. And the young people responded to that. That's why there was 300 of them. Don't think kids are looking for entertainment. When we, went, when we gathered in a group, we were there to learn. We weren't there just to have fun. Now, did we have fun? I think we had more fun than probably kids that were seeking to have fun. We were immersed in the Word of God. We were constantly encouraged to read the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to memorize the Word of God, and then to go and witness from the Word of God. But she was a disciplinarian, and she was able to confront. But as she will relate later, I'll show this. She loved to laugh and make memories and celebrate big and make simple things special. She poured into people out of the wellspring of her love for Jesus. He had made everything beautiful in his time. As painful as it was for us to say goodbye to Mum, this side of heaven, as much as we will miss her presence here in our lives, I have seen the incredible love and beauty of our God as we walk through these past months. And I can say with full confidence in his goodness that he has made this beautiful to the praise of his glory. In this last week with my beloved mum, God gave us a few more sacred treasures to leave within our heart's memory of all that her life was about. Her last verse committed to memory. Can you imagine in the last week she's memorizing the scriptures? She committed to memory John 3, verse 30. And this is the verse. He must increase, but I must decrease. The thing was always amazing to me that on Wednesday nights when all these 300 kids would be down in the basement, did Sunday teach? No, she oftentimes, she had me teach. I was in seminary at, or Bible college at the time. She had Kenny Dodd teach. She had different ones teaching the Word of God. She would be out there listening. She trained us to do what she did. I see such sweet significance in her final verse committed to memory. And as her physical body was decreasing, her gaze upon Jesus was increasing. 
I've watched as she wrote for the last time in her well-loved Bible, Fullness of Joy, above Psalm 16, verse 11. And the last words spoken on this earth were so fitting to the great loving of her heart. When she overheard us say the name of Jesus, she reached out her hand and said, Welcome his presence. It is beyond us to measure the full impact of Sunday's life, but my mum was always quick to say, it isn't about our great faith, but it's about our great God. He does the work. She was a woman who beheld the cross, saw her sin, believed in her Savior, fell deeply in love with Jesus, and yielded her life to him for whatever he wanted to do through her. And because it was his life living within her, she truly lived. And she lived for his glory. I present to you my friend Sunday. A lady that has impacted my life, and I believe there is potentially Sundays in this room, both men and women, whom God can use in the lives of a few other people. Just let your life be filled with his love. And do not think that God cannot use you. God took this young lady, just a graduate out of undergraduate school, Bible college, has transformed the lives of... And I could give you names of people that were in that group who today... Uh, significant leaders in this community and in the state of Kansas. They're all in that group. People whose lives have been changed because of the impact of one life then continued on. And may we be people like Sunday.